Welcome everyone to our first event of the academic year hosted by the Center for Gender Studies, sorry, for the Center of Middle East Studies at Brown. My name is Nadia Ali and I'm Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies. And I'm the new director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this academic year two new initiatives, one focusing on women and sexuality with reference to the Middle East and its diasporas, and this is not only because it's something that I've been working on, but because um, of the fact that gender and sexuality are so key in understanding wider processes and transformations in the region and also with reference to the di diaspora. And of course, our event today with Professor Zahra Ali is marking the beginning of this initiative. I would also like to flag uh, another initiative that we are starting, which is focusing on racialization and racism in, in relation to the Middle East and its diasporas as well. And um, as many of you, of course, over the summer, uh, we were, um, many of us were, of course, in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, but thinking beyond, you know, signatures and petitions, what can we do? And in relation to Middle East studies, the um, issue of racialization and racism has been understudied and ignored and this is something that we would like to foreground here at Brown. Uh, but today it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Zaha Ali. Uh, Zaha, yes there you are. Yes, oh. hello. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Um, Zaha and I have known each other for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. Zaha is a sociologist uh, and assistant professor at Rutgers University in New York. Her research explores dynamics of women and gender, social and political movements in relation to Islam, the Middle East, and particularly in context of war and conflict. And Zaha, as many of you know, has of course focused her ethnographic empirical research on Iraq. More broadly, Zaha is interested in issues of uh, capitalism, post-coloniality, decolonial feminisms, and epistemologies. Um, Zaha is also a feminist activist, and she has been involved in various um, transnational feminist knowledge production initiatives, specifically in relation to Iraq and Syria. And I've been following mm -hmm. her work closely, and we've also collaborated on some of them. So welcome, Zaha. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. So uh, Zaha and I will be in conversation for a while and then we will open up uh, the discussion. So I'd like to ask you, those of you who are registered in the webinar, to use the Q&A function to um, submit your question. And of course, those of you who are watching us via YouTube will also be able to field questions and uh, we will be able to see the questions here. Um, so Zaha, today we want to speak about your book. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for me, the book is um, providing a big contribution to the study of contemporary Iraq, while of course also enriching our knowledge in terms of women and gender studies with reference to the Middle East, but also more broadly. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, one of the things that makes your book unique is that it's on the one side, very much grounded in in-depth ethnographic research which is not very common as, uh, in relation to Iraq because of the situation of war and conflict, only very few people actually spend considerable amount of time there and you spend um, almost two years there. And we, we will speak about this later. Mm -hmm. But while your book uh, provides us with a narrative and analysis of Iraqi women's activism post 2003 and also providing a historical context it um, also contributes to debates around gender and nation, gender and nationalism, mm. and conflict. So I want to unpack some of these issues um, with you later on. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like you to kick off this uh, discussion by sharing uh, with us what you see as the main themes of the book. All right, thank you. I mean, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much, Nadia. It's such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Of course, I would have preferred to have you in person, uh, but uh, I also want to share the fact that, I mean, really it's your work that has inspired my work. I was a, a master student when I first read your book. 
um, um, so untold stories, right? And uh, and then I approached you. I was a very shy master student at the time, and I came to London at SOAS, and I approached you, and I was kind of thinking of starting a PhD. And it was very early on. It was even before settling and living in Baghdad that I met you. So so thank you so much for contributing so much. Uh, I mean, to my research process, and 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 um, I, I think that this book, showing the book. Uh, would would have been very uh, difficult or I guess you 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 have been very central in in making it possible so thank you so much so yeah to uh, um, I mean very often when I when I present the book I say that this book is um, really a her story of Iraq in the sense that it tells the story of Iraq from the point of view of women and especially from the point of view of women who happen to be activists. So it's a book about feminism in Iraq, and it is as well a feminist book about Iraq. Uh, so although I use a lot of historical material, this her story is very much based on uh, in-depth interviews with women's rights activists and women who have had some sort uh, of political activism. So I, the book is really based on, on, on in-depth interviews. When, when I was writing the book, uh, I would say that at the time uh, it relied on around 80 uh, in-depth interviews with, with uh, you know, half of the women I've, I've uh, followed and spent time with over years. Uh, but now, I mean, since, since actually my, my research has expanded, really I have, I've done more than 100 in-depth in interviews with women from um, different political, economic, social background, different ethnic, religious, sectarian background, uh, starting from the age of uh, the very early 20, uh, 20s to uh, their late 70s, right? And so through these interviews that are very uh, central to the book, I, I try to provide really a, an oral her story of Iraq. Um, and generally, I provide really an intersectional and relational analysis uh, of issues of women, gender, state, and religion. Um, so how do these categories really exist in relation to each other? How do these intersections work in different period of time, right? Uh, and how women's uh, economic, social, and political experiences really allow us to make sense of these categories? Uh, so the book is very uh, chronological, right? I start with the 1920s, with the very formation of the state under uh, British colonial domination, and I also explore the revolutionary period of the 40s and the 50s. You also wrote, wrote about that in your previous research, Nadia. And um, I show how much women and gender issues uh, at the time were very central in shaping the colonial and post-colonial nation state project. And I mean, this period, actually, the, the 40s and the 50s are very central uh, because it's the period during which the main legal frame that really defines women's legal rights was established, Qanun uh, al al-Shakhsiya, the Personal Status Code, that was established in 1959. And in, in kind of the first two chapter, I mean, I, I explain, actually, I try to explain the reasons why uh, this Personal Status Code at the time was one of the most progressive personal status code in the whole region, right? I mean, it was progressive, but it was still pretty, very much patriarchal, right? Uh, so so I'm, I'm, uh, the, really the first uh, chapters uh, explicate uh, how, I mean, there's too many reasons to go through now, but I mean, how actually this personal status code was at, as the, at the time supposed to represent national unity between sect, especially because it gathers Sunni and Shia jurisprudence, and also very importantly, because feminist activists, uh, especially anti-imperialist feminist activists, feminists from the left really participated in drafting this personal status code. And this is very central in, in something that I will perhaps talk about a little bit later, about what is going on today in terms of women's legal rights. So I also talk about the 60s and the 70s in the book, and I really dedicate a chapter on, on the Ba'ath period. Uh, showing uh, really the relationship between, um, let's say, the, the general structural uh, everyday life, uh, conditions of everyday life, and also political violence with uh, 
what what it, what is it to to live in 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 the 60s and the 70s in Iraq where you have strong state infrastructures a strong uh, an excellent one of the best education uh, system in the region especially in relation to women but at the same time you also live in an authoritarian regime right you re live in a space where you cannot exist outside of the main women's rights organization that is associated to the Ba'ath regime so I engage also with that and when it comes to the the 1980s I I really rely on on on, on women's uh, uh, on my interviews and, and on the the experiences of the Iran Iran Iraq war and on how this really has uh, changed uh, uh, um, gender representation, gender practices. And, and I try also to analyze in terms of these categories, genders, gender and nation, how actually uh, it's a period where the Ba'ath regime started to sectarian, sectarian uh, mirrorize or, you know, to shape into the, <laughs> to shape through a sectarian you know, or ethnic frame, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, its political repression, right? And how this is very, very much gendered and how actually uh, Kurdish uh, women, uh, women's rights activists and also women, women activists who were uh, displaced or who had to uh, uh, leave Iraq, who were expelled from Iraq uh, during the Tesfirat, Hamlet Tesfirat, so the campaign of displacement of, of certain categories of the population, how all of this really impacted a woman's, a woman's life and how all of this is very much gendered. And then I, I, I dedicate a lot of, of, uh, um, of um, long, long section in the book on, on the 1990s, because I think the 1990s, I mean, we, we tend to, um, to really start when we talk about today in 2003. Of course, 2003 is very central, but uh, in adopting actually a, a, a broader historical uh, uh, analysis, I really want to insist on the fact that if there is something that really reshifted Iraq, Iraq's tra trajectory as a strong state, as strong infrastructures, as fu a functioning society was really the shift that happened in the 1990s with, of course, following the invasion of Kuwait, the incredible US-led uh, bombing of, of Iraq that was you know, absolutely devastating and that uh, really turned uh, a developed country into a pre-industrial age, right? And, and these surgical strikes that were really targeting uh, that I mean, they were presented as surgical strike, but they were really targeting water, electri electricity plant, bridges. And then after this, this devastating campaign of bomb, uh, bombing, uh, what you know, is called by some scholars the invisible war, which is the, the UN sanction that we should actually call the, the US UN sanctions, <laughs> that, uh, because the, the US administration played such a central role, role in implementing these horrible sanctions that plunged the country into survival. And in the book, really, the woman I interview, they tell us in great detail how this period totally changed their life. Totally, uh, I mean, making, for example, their salary irrelevant, uh, destroying the health and education infrastructures uh, uh, that they, they and the whole society uh, uh, relied on, right? So how really this period of the 90s, the war, the sanctions really redefined the social fabric of the society uh, and also how it, it, it um, created the emergence of, of new forms of patriarchy and new forms of conservatism coming from the state. I, I talk about, for example, Hamla al Imaniya, the face campaign that was launched by the Ba'ath regime, and also from the society as well. And then, of course, I mean, I dedicate really this kind of, um, I guess, perhaps 50% of the book is, is dedicated to the post 2003 period because it is the period where I, uh, um, through which I, con I conducted field work. And so really, uh, I show in the book that the, when the US-led invasion and occupation happened, uh, the country was already in this terrible situation and, and how it actually reshaped uh, uh, um, this uh, political crisis into sectarian, ethnic, communal terms when actually the US administration really established a communal system that uh, is equivalent to, to institutionalized racism, basically, and how it plunged the country into poverty and how it brought uh, an elite uh, from abroad uh, that, uh, I mean, really 
uh, is involved in some kind of a militia mafia state around uh, uh, the rich resources of Iraq and, 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 um, and, and how actually this privatization, the militarization of, 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 of space has really shaped uh, uh, women's everyday life. And I talk in particular about, I go back to this, uh, um, to uh, talking about the personal status code. Uh, really, the, it's important to know actually that the, the very first uh, demonstration that was organized in post-invasion Iraq, the, post, uh, the, the first civil society demonstration that was organized in post-invasion Iraq was a women's protest, mm -hmm. protesting against uh, uh, the, the, basically the attempt to abolish the personal status code by this new conservative sectarian patriarchal elite that came to power with the US administration. And uh, so it's very interesting because if you follow uh, really the, the development of this frame of right, the personal status code that gather most of women's legal rights, uh, if you follow it in time, you can really follow how issues of gender, nation, state, religion imbricate differently, right? And, and really it's, it's, it's very telling that one of the very first legal reform that was undertaken by this new elite that came with the Americans is to uh, try to abolish this quiet progressive personal status code and establish, you know, in its place, a sectarian, right, an identity-based personal status mm -hmm. code. So this is just a brief overview, <laughs> but uh, I guess you also have other questions. So I'll start yeah, here. Yes, of course. I mean, like you, I was struggling, you know, after the invasion, when I was asked to write about the impact of um, the invasion and occupation. And I, like you, felt it was so important to first provide a historical context for so many reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. partly because um, there is, of course, for those of us who are based in a Western context and are writing to a Western audience, or at least we're being read and uh, listened to, you know, we constantly, have, of course, have to challenge this idea that uh, there's something essential about Muslim women's oppression um, and uh, that it's sort of an inevitability. And so looking at the history is very important. And also, of course, I th the other issue around Western feminism, the idea that feminism is, is Western. And if you look at the long history of feminist activism in Iraq, uh, you see that, you know, we didn't need uh, Americans or, you know, British feminists to try to tell Iraqi women what feminism is about. So, I, you know, I, and I think the wider problem that we are facing within Middle East studies, or let's say more actually within the media and policy discourses that this ahistorical view of the Middle East, mm -hmm. which is of course very problematic. But what I'd yeah. like you to um, elaborate uh, on a bit more is these two years of in-depth research in Iraq. You know, we talked about it. I mean, you were in many cities. I mean, mainly, I think you were mainly based in Baghdad with your family, but you also went to Erbil, Suleimania, to Najaf, Karbala, Kufa, Nasiriya. Mm -hmm. So can you just reflect a little bit on this and particularly in terms of, you know, navigating being back in Iraq after you'd grown up in France and being with your family while also being a researcher, can you just sort of briefly reflect on that, please? Yes, sure. Uh, so, I mean, it was it was definitely a, a kind of a, a challenging fieldwork at the time because, I mean, I, I I'm still conducting fieldwork. I, I, I guess since COVID, it's it's a bit complicated. But last time I was in Iraq was last December, actually, to to um, conduct research uh, within the, the the uprising in Tahrir Square, Baghdad. But since 2010, I, I have been so. What I did basically when I started my research is that I, I settled in Baghdad in my family's house. Uh, so, which, which was uh, my, um, Allah Yarham Habibi, my, my grandmother's uh, house. And I was living with women, with my grandmother, with Khala Maluk, my auntie, and, and, and partly also with my mom. Uh, so, so it was a, it, it was also a beautiful experience, right, to be there in 2010. Uh, um, sharing my everyday life in the neighborhoods, which is the, in the north of Baghdad, uh, that is called Al-Karmiya, which is a very religious neighborhood. Uh, so, so, you know, living this everyday life, I stayed there for two years. Uh, to be honest, I also stayed there because I wanted to live there. <laughs> and it happened that I was also, you know, working on, on a research. And it was challenging for sure because it was a period where the everyday life was marked by explosions. It was really the time, I mean, of course, it was not as bad as 2006 and 7, 
when actually uh, we, I mean, in my family, we, we lost several members of, of my family in 2006 and seven. But it was very bad because, uh, I mean, if you if you kind of try to picture Baghdad, Baghdad is is a uh, it's 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 less now. But at the time, I was doing in field work and living there. Um, Baghdad was segmented by uh, concrete walls divided into ethnic. Um, you really couldn't circulate uh, um, without crossing so many checkpoints. The, you know, the, the, really the space is, is totally uh, militarized. So at every... Sorry, I think that uh, Zahra is uh, frozen. I hope she'll be able to uh, join us in a moment. Um, so I uh, know that uh, she spent quite a bit of time uh, in, in Baghdad, the other issue that I'm hoping to discuss with her uh, once she joins us is the um, tension between being an activist and being a researcher, and particularly uh, in, in the context of the fact that the diaspora played a very complex and complicated role with respect to the invasion and the occupation of Iraq. And so, um, you know, many of us who were outside um, had to take position in terms of, you know, sanctions, um, invasion and occupation. Uh, but then being in Iraq, um, you know, might have sort of shifted uh, our perceptions. And so when Zaha first came to me, actually, when she was still an MA student and wanted to work with me on her PhD, she wanted to look at the um, dichotomy between a secular and religious feminism that was her main aim to explore. Um, and as she went, um, I mean, I also found that in my work is that that distinction actually didn't hold true anymore, but it's a distinction that um, she thought was important as she was based in Paris, where of course there was a big backlash against Islamic feminism. Um, and I was also going to ask, uh, <laughs> I hope uh, Zaha will be able to come back. Um, that uh, Zaha actually played a very important role in France in terms of debates around Islamic feminism. And so this was kind of the lens that she, she brought with her as she was um, going to start her, her research in Iraq. However, in Iraq, that uh, distinction um, did not really hold true in the sense that the, the positions between secular and Islamic feminists was much more blurred than it would have been um, in, in the diaspora. Um, the, um, the emergence of women's organizing, the mushrooming of women's organizations um, is another aspect that uh, Zaha has uh, illustrated quite broadly um, in her work. Um, so um, that I can also speak, because I don't want to speak for, for Zaha, uh, I will say a little bit about uh, my own work on Iraq. So uh, I found that uh, in the aftermath of the invasion, um, Iraqi women were really trying to uh, take part in this new construction of Iraq, whether they had been pro-invasion or against the invasion. Um, and they, um, they tried through um, initiatives, civil society organizations, but also um, NGOs and formal organizations to mobilize against um, the increase of uh, gender-based violence that we've seen since 2003. But also, you know, in the uh, immediate context of the invasion and of course until now, a crisis, a humanitarian crisis, um, crisis in terms of a uh, remilitarization of society. I mean, the, the whole idea of uh, the invasion as it was packaged to us was that it would bring democracy and human rights to Iraq, uh, but also demilitarization of, you know, previously a highly militarized country. But we know that the opposite has taken place and uh, Iraq is uh, one of the most <laughs> militarized uh, countries again uh, in the region. And women very early on have been at the forefront of challenging um, you know, the, the lack of um, services provided by the state, 
the increased militarization, authoritarianism. And one of the issues that uh, Zaha speaks about a lot in her book is um, the role that women have played with respect to sectarianism, the growth in sectarianism. So the um, issue of the, the personal status uh, code plays, of course, an, an important role. Um, as Zahra said, you know, for shortly after the invasion, a law that was actually unifying Shia and Sunni Muslims in Iraq, so that's the personal status code um, that is um, regulating marriage, divorce, child custody, and inheritance. The, uh, some uh, Shia Islamist groups tried to um, change the law to much more, um, uh, I think Zaha is joining us again. Oh God, <laughs> this is horrible. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. My internet just stopped. Oh yeah. Uh, can you put on your camera? Yes. Yes. Oh God, 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 God. What the hell? <laughs> oh, you cannot start your video because the, the host has stopped it. Uh, I don't know. Um, can we have some technical assistance, please? And yeah. let Zaha join. Oh my God, what the hell is this? No, uh, Zaha, I think you're on, so please don't swear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Okay, this is my worst fear and it's happening. So I guess the rest is fine, you know, anything can happen. Okay. So. Um, while uh, we are working on getting you on uh, camera, I, I will um, ask you to elaborate a little bit more, just for a few minutes, um, mm -hmm. on the issue of being... Oh, yes, great. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I am so sorry. This is really... I don't know what happened. Yeah, it, yeah I'm sorry too. But <laughs> um, So you were speaking about your family and being with your family and doing... Yes, yeah, yeah. So I'll be sure it's because we, we lost a lot of time. But <laughs> no, I was saying that uh, what was very interesting is... Um, so in a way, also being a woman conducted, conducting field work in such a militarized space uh, made it interesting in the sense that I think if I was a young man stopping, check, uh, taking pictures, you know, circulating within the different uh, uh, checkpoints, I would have been stopped and checked all the time, right? But because I'm, I'm, because I'm a woman, because, you know, I, I, I'm a young woman, uh, I actually, uh, <laughs> you know, benefited from kind of the, the gender... Uh, um, uh, the sexist prejudices around being a woman and being totally uh, incapable of doing any harm. And so I, I was able actually to circulate uh, through checkpoints very easily. I was very, very rarely, rarely stopped and, and checked and, and, and people uh, just, uh, I mean, most, most of the time the security forces or the soldiers, you know, they were smiling, they were letting me in pretty easily. So this is kind of the the other side of, of, of sexism, right? And of, of very normative gender representation is that, is that you can get away with a lot of things. So, uh, while you were away, I was um, speaking a little bit, I started to speak a little bit about the tensions of being based in the diaspora um, and um, then, you know, spending lots of time in Iraq and also the tensions in terms of being a researcher and activist, so around positionality. I mean, it's something that I'm grappling with quite a bit. And I know um, you've also gone through different, different stages. I mean, when you came to see me first, you had, a, I think, you know, very different views on issues having grown mm. up in France after you went to Iraq. And I guess also spent some time in London, you know, things <laughs> shifted. So if you can tell us a little bit about your positionality and particularly in the context of the tensions between diaspora and you know academia and then activism and you know it's playing out in different contexts so what is your take on this yes so this is such an important question um, so I, I grew up in a household, I mean, uh, of, in a family of exile, right? So I, I grew up in a household where we, we have been told, uh, we, we, you know, when I was a kid in, in the 90s, very, very small in the 90s, we thought that we would go back to Iraq after 91 if the regime fall. And then we had this dream of coming back and the, 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 there was something very much, uh, Iraq was some kind of a, of a Jannah, you know, it was like some kind of a heaven, a place where I'm supposed to go back at some point. And so uh, growing up this way, 
in in a, a political exile house household when i when i actually settled in iraq and lived there of course it challenged a lot of my diasporic uh, exile type of, of of representations of iraq and then i realized actually also uh, uh, what uh, what this elite what this political elite that ha that came from uh, uh, exile uh, uh, you know had done to the country i also realized so in france i was i was very much involved in anti racist feminist activism uh, i was uh, working a lot uh, on on muslim feminism and and really i i had to reconsider and reconceptualize these categories when i arrived in iraq right of course for example the category islam the way we theorize about it, the way we, we theorize around Islamophobia is, is, is very different uh, um, um, than when we, uh, well, in the context of Islamophobia and racism and when Islam is a minority and very much racialized, right? It's very different than when you theorize it in a context where you have a dominant power that, is, that, that used Islam to assert its power, right? The, the Shia Islamist conservative that came with the, with the, with the US-led administration in 2003. So you, you kind of have to reshape your categories and and also just generally i think that when we uh, as 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 a sociologist i'm also very much an ethnographer and, and nadia you are an anthropologist and you know how much um doing research doing in-depth re research so before let's say i settle in iraq i'm just a, i'm a feminist activist i have all my dreams my representations my idea of what feminist is and should be and then and then i actually interview well, you know you go through like you interview over 100 women who have been through a lot and you leave uh, uh, somewhere where being a woman uh, activist actually can can get you killed you kind of re reconceptualize a lot of things and you, you reshape your own thinking so i definitely had to think of this a lot and i guess perhaps also the, maybe a, a little bit the work of Stuart Hall, but in my more intellectual, perhaps even more, I would say, philosophical kind of trajectory, I think that the work of Edouard Glissant really helped me to, to make sense of my different uh, positionalities, because positionality is also something that changed, right? That uh, uh, according to our experiences, and, and I think that uh, Edouard Glissant's uh, poetic of uh, la poétique de la relation really helped me in trying to make sense of 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 uh, how how we actually don't uh, how we we can we can theorize and at the same time so we raise categories so gender nation state religion but at the same time we stay open to the fact that these categories are constantly changing and we are we as researchers something that I actually uh, it's the way I teach sociology as well to my students, to my undergrad students and my master's student too, is, is really to consider positionality as uh, who you are reading, what, right? The, for example, the author you are reading are socially, economically, sexually, uh, racially, uh, ethnically positioned. But you as well, who, you know, when you're reading this sociological text, uh, you are also uh, positioned. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very, uh, it, it's a difficult thing, especially when we are activists, because uh, uh, as activists, we also have um, kind of a, a whole uh, a whole ethical consideration. Like we ha we we also have a, a certain type of ideological frame, right? So it's something that I'm 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 struggling with, but I'm I'm trying to theorize, and I'm I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying just just as you do as well to think of, especially when it comes to feminist knowledge production. A feminine, it's spe especially because I mean, since now I'm, I'm you know I have a tenure track a university position. So I'm not the young researcher I used to be when I was just a precarious PhD student. And, and I, I also realized this and I realized the impact of the knowledge that I produce, right? So how do then I, I make sense and also do justice to all these, these, these uh, women's rights activists uh, uh, with whom uh, you know, I have talked for so many hours, spent so, so much time with and who are, are at the center of my research? Yeah, and actually I'd like to follow up on that, uh, which is so um, the feminist activists that you talked to, you know, which played a very important role in trying to challenge, you know, some of the developments when it comes to increased militarization in Iraq, um, the return to authoritarianism, the sectorization of Iraq. Um, so. Can you tell us a little bit more about these feminists? You know, who are they? What are they doing? What are some of the divisions within the feminist movement in Iraq? Well, I mean, uh, feminists in Iraq are 
uh, are or feminisms in Iraq are as diverse, heterogeneous, contradictory, right, <laughs> as any feminist movement around the world. Of course, there are specificity to the to the postcolonial context, to the fact that it's a context that has experienced so much wars, destruction. Uh, and so there are certain issues that probably get exacerbated. So I, I, in trying to make sense of all of this, I, I draw certain categories, you know, I talk about the feminists who are kind of NGOIs in the sense that uh, because in, in, in you write about, uh, about it in your book, what kind of liberation, Nadia, when you talk about this huge network of funding and money that was dedicated to uh, women and gender issues and, and, and so-called democratization in the frame really of the occupation, right? So, so in, in, in order to kind of justify this, this colonial occupation uh, as a, an, a, a campaign to, to liberate uh, women in Iraq and bring democracy. So of course, there, there was a lot of money, a mm -hmm. huge amount of money. So the first years of the invasion, of course, I mean, you, you have a situation where the state has collapsed, right? The, the debasification, the, the, the invasion is, itself has destroyed the state. So you are women activists, some, some of actually some activists who were, who were living abroad came back trying to, you know, uh, with this great intention to uh, build a country uh, uh, and, and other activists who were there had totally different experiences, right? Because they were living under an authoritarian regime. So, so this happened in the context of, of all of this money circulating. So it was really, really hard for women actually to navigate and, and uh, kind of keep, keep uh, um, uh, their own ideological, their own agenda, and at the same time uh, dealing with, 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 this, with this network of funding. So I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of pragmatism. It's never, it's never black and white. It's never uh, an organization that really follow blindly <laughs> the, the donors, uh, you know, the donors goals. And, but but you, you still, despite that, uh, have similar kind of initiatives and you have a similar kind of a repertoire, right? That is, is really present everywhere in Iraq, especially in the first years of the invasion, actually. Yeah. Now it's, 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 it's pretty different, especially with the uprising is very different, yeah. with, with the rise of social movements is very different. But at the time it was really, you could find the same, so it's like human rights campaign, gender mainstreaming uh, uh, campaigns uh, around like uh, teaching Iraqis how to vote and draft the constitution, you know, all of these campaigns that are implementing, implemented in a similar way across the region, right? And I would say across the, the third world. Uh, so so th there are this thing, and, 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 and I also show in my research that interestingly, this has also made the borders between secular and, and, and religious or Islamist activism very porous because you had the same campaign that were implemented among uh, secular activists or so-called secular because I try to complicate, of course, the, the, the notion of secular and the notion of religious and, and, and go beyond uh, this, the, the, this uh, dichotomy. But so, so there is this, but also at the same time in this situation where you have really, a, a, um, I mean, you really have a structural violence in the sense that the everyday life, the everyday functioning of the society is extremely challenging. You know, uh, very, uh, very little electricity, access to running water, a very, really failing state, uh, state infrastructure. So you have women who are also organizing as and acting as substitutes of the absence of state institutions. So this is more happening at the grassroots level, mm -hmm. right? So you have, you have, of course, work, uh, you know, at the, the legal level, all these work around uh, adopting, uh, adopting like a law uh, sanctioning domestic violence. You have, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of work done around the, the personal status code, of course. But you also have on the other side, a lot of grassroots work on how to help a family, a family access to electricity, running water, uh, uh, and also, I mean, also how to, how to tackle uh, sexual violence. So you have different strategies, you have certain organizations that try to kind of act as partners of this very uh, failed state. Uh, uh, and who would tend to, so for example, you have uh, the Iraqi woman network, Shabakat al-Nisa al-Araqiyat, who is really working towards trying to really convince, uh, uh, for example, al-Marja'iyya, religious authorities going to, and, and still doing that actually in the, in the past few weeks, because the campaign to, 
um, adopt a law sanctioning domestic violence is, is, is actually going on in Iraq until now. And so really knocking at doors, trying to pressure to kind of adopt this legislation. And then you have, you know, other, other organization, you have the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, for example, that have really specialized in dealing with sexual violence and abuse and, and has uh, uh, really at the grassroots level just open shelters that are considered illegal by the state, right? So it's really acting totally outside of the state. But, uh, you know, uh, the, those are like kind of groups that are established or formally organized. But there's, there's plenty of things. Um, when I actually started to kind of extend my field work, I, I then uh, really looked at youth initiatives, a lot of grassroots women initiatives uh, happening uh, uh, in, you know, let's say all over the place, right? Because, because you have a situation where there's so much to do uh, that people organize uh, um, um, in in in, in uh, non non -for formal way uh, and around this notion of, of for example el medani which is which is a notion that is is really central in 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 protest movement in Iraq and in the uprising for example. Mm. Yeah, I want to get also to the more contemporary context in the moment, but I. Uh, you know, listening to you and having read your work, and also in relation to my work, that as you said previously, I mean, much is uh, is not unique to Iraq. I mean, so much is unique because of the specific history, the specific histories of multiple wars and sanctions. And I agree with you that sanctions um, are so important in understanding post 2003 Iraq. Um, but I think one of the dilemmas that Iraqi feminists are facing. Um, is a dilemma that um, feminists are facing throughout the world and, and certainly in the Middle East, which is, you know, and how far to try to work with the state and try to reform mm -hmm. and, you know, try to be involved in initiatives, I mean, often sort of on legal issues, but also on other issues around, you know, education, welfare, medical issues, mm -hmm. in a situation where the state increasingly turns authoritarian, mm. uh, you know, militarist, uh, sectarian, and becomes a problem, right? So mm. how do we put then as feminists position ourselves? I think that's, that's a big dilemma. And clearly um, in the Iraqi context as elsewhere, um, feminists have different strategies and also those strategies might change over time as the context changes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. I think um, I, 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 and, and, and my more recent research actually on the uprising and spending time with, with protesters in Tahrir Square made me also realize uh, how much also, um, you know, it is also important to, I mean, renew our categories as the context is changing, but also I think that the uprising really pushed women, women's rights activists and a lot of kind of established feminists outside of their, their comfort zone, right? Maybe they're comfortable talking with the UN women, a lot of them, maybe they're comfortable talking, you know, about CDAO and gender mainstreaming. And then you have protest movement that are very radical that are asking for, you know, get, getting rid of the status to, to quo and, and, and putting in place a whole new system, right? And, 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 and then you have a new generation of, of women who are actually not affiliated to any organization and who are really, really at the core of this uprising. I mean, something that I say and, and that I think is very important because I analyze the different um, in my recent research, the different protest movements. So I analyzed the 2015 protest movement, the 2018 protest movement. And, and for me right now, what, what actually made the, the very last protest movement of October 2019, what made it an uprising, it's the participation of women. Yeah. And, and in Tahrir Square, if you, if you speak to people, they tell you is when the, when the woman was, uh, when the women are here, the society, al mujtama you know, the society is here, right? And, and this, there will be, there, there are so many things to say, but, but really it, it, it shows that this specific type of protest that is spontaneous, uh, that is not formally organized, is really actually happening at a, I would say a deeper level, because it's happening really at the societal level. Mm. Not really the legal or the, the, the political level in the sense of pushing people to vote or draft a constitution. No, it's happening. Being present in the square and, 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 and is something that is extremely subversive, subversive in Iraq. And, and the proof also uh, is the, the incredible repression 
that women and uh, of course th these young women and young men who are, are present in, in in the protest are facing and and this repression is very much gendered of course it's kidnapping of women 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 activists it's also uh, portraying the uprising as something immoral and, and, and if you see, if you go to Tahrir Square, there, there are uh, walls and there's a lot, actually a lot of, of banners that, that say, we are women, uh, um, so Tha'irat, uh, uh, um, as opposed to Aherat, uh, uh, basically. So we are re women revolutionaries, we are not whores, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, this is how the women who have participated to the uprising have been portrayed. So, so we're seeing forms of activism that are outside of the categories of, I would even say outside of, of feminism as a category. It's, of course, it's uh, intersectional or relational feminism allow us to, to, to still use the word feminism, but I think it's even broader than that. And in, in actually my, my recent research, I talk about this uprising as really a rise against, against Negro power. It's a rise against, against herbicide, against a situation where the everyday life is, is made impossible, especially when we think of, for example, a, a region or a context such as Al Basra, for example, right? And, and this really, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in, in, in this case, maybe talking, uh, you know, about um, uh, also the body, uh, yeah, women's body uh, as present in, in, in the square uh, is, is, is for me very, very important in, in really creating new space, creating new discursive space, uh, creating new imaginaries, right? Uh, uh, creating also a, a new, new material space, right? For, for, for women to be present and for the society or let's say the new social contract to be negotiated uh, uh, within, within the squares of protest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to follow up in a moment in, in terms of the, the recent developments also under COVID-19. But one of the questions um, the audience po poses is around Islamist activism. So we, we, we tend to, I mean, you make it very clear. And I actually spoke a little bit about that when I was trying to fill in the void when you disappeared, that <laughs> we cannot really speak so much about a, a very clear distinction between the secular and an Islamic feminism in Iraq. But what about Islamist activism? Mm -hmm. Islamist so, uh, feminist activism, does that exist? And what kind of form or shape does it take? Well, so, so um, this is very, um, uh, I talk about it a lot in the book actually. And uh, so where I try to complicate the debate is, is that even using the category secular uh, and, and the category Islamist in the post 2003 context were actually it's a context where the dominant power, right, uh, who are dominating the state is actually, the state and also the streets through the militias, right, are actually uh, um, Islamist uh, political groups, right? So, um, so I, um, in, 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 in this sense, also uh, um, like uh, sectarianism as a category uh, is, is also very important in, uh, so the, the Islamists who are trying to, question the personal status quo based on sectarian uh, lines are the Shia Islamists, not the Sunni Islamists, right? Because in this context uh, uh, where um, it's the Shias and the Kurdish that came to power in 2003 and who now are dominated, dominating the political sphere, uh, Sunni Islamism, Islamism has really, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, had very different type of, of, of politics and also very different types of gender politics. So really talking about Islamism, we need to also uh, define uh, what kind of Islamism we're talking about. But um, also uh, uh, just generally, I think that, yes, there are, uh, uh, I've met uh, throughout my research, women who identify as Islamist, uh, uh, but also develop, uh, uh, um, I mean, feminist uh, type of, of, of demands, of claims. And, uh, and I would say that also the reason why a lot of them define themselves as Islamists is because they are either Sunni or Shia Islamists. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of the post 2003 regime, if they want to exist politically, this is also the, this is the only way for them to define themselves, right? So it's really associated to a form of identity politics that is 
connected to the nature of the regime. But I would say that there's also, so, so the, I would say that Shia Islamist women activists are really, uh, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them uh, um, trying to assert the sectarian identity and push actually for uh, the sectar sectarianization of, 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 the, of the personal status of women and legal rights. And, and they are really, uh, I think the mirror, they, they just, um, they are really the mirror of, 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 of conservatism and, and sectarian politics, Where, whereas uh, that doesn't mean that Shia women, you know, uh, uh, actually uh, supports uh, th uh, that kind of, of, of um, identity politics uh, at all. So, so, so I would say it's it, it, uh, it, it, it's it's very complex. Uh, but uh, the, the the lines between saying that if you secular, that means that you are necessarily pro woman, and if you are as act, uh, Islamist, that uh, that means that you are necessarily against women, it is not working at all. And and mm -hmm. one final point on on this is that we see, for example, in the current debate happening in Iraq right now around adopting a law sanctioning domestic violence, that both secular political parties and Islamist political parties all consider that this law is too subversive and it's against the family uh, and, and, and they all uh, they all basically advocate against this law. So we see that, you know, conservatism goes, you know, beyond the secular or, or Islamist kind of binary. Yes. So I'd like to share another question by um, Hanas Ali Klein, who is a senior in high school with roots in Iraq and Iran. And Hana is interested in hearing um, more specifically about youth uh, initiatives, female youth initiatives. Um, she'd like to know about um, the, the way that the invasion has affected women's education in both secondary schools and universities. And I guess in terms of female youth initiatives, uh, it would be interesting to find out what's happening now, um, especially in the context of, of protests. Yes, sure. So, so there's a lot, uh, um, I mean, go, going on. Uh, so in, in terms of youth, I think it's also important to remind ourselves that when I say uh, young people, um, um, in, in relation to the uprising, I'm talking of people who are as 20, 20 years old, right? So it's really a new generation. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a contrast happening um, between the older generation of activists, the more established, because and, and the youngest generation, because they don't necessarily share the same experience, right? Young, I mean, the youth, if, if you are, uh, uh, if you are um, um, 20 years old in Iraq, you, you kind of, you grew up in the sectarian war, you grew up uh, uh, knowing, um, um, uh, knowing about the, the, the invasion of ISIS, you grew up in a country where you, where you had very, uh, a, a, um, the absence, you grew up in a context where the state was very absent or, or dysfunctional or part of your everyday problem, right? And you also totally, you have no experience of the Ba'ath regime, you have no experience of authoritarianism, right? So it's a different uh, uh, political imaginary that, that the youth, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are um, uh, um, are being active around basically. So, so, so for example, um, uh, if you go to Nejaf and Karbala, young women are very, very concerned with uh, conservatism, with with kind of the everyday life uh, being deprived of 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 um, dressing the way they want, uh, uh, with, for example, not being religious, right, in, in these spaces that are, that are extremely conservative and extremely uh, religious. So if you go to Baghdad, uh, you have uh, women activists who uh, are, uh, are going to organize, I don't know, debates about, about women's legal rights. Uh, so so it, it, I guess it, dep it depends on the context, but there, there's, very, very, there's, there's different things going on. And, and I think what's interesting is if you look at the way people in Iraq use the term uh, Nashat Madani, so activist or civil society activist, uh, you, will, you will understand that this really describes a person that is either active, for example, uh, collecting um, clothes for poor families, uh, and 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 uh, to uh, so something let's say very humanitarian to the point of uh, somebody being very politically anti-Islamist and anti-militia. Mm -hmm. So it, it really shows that there's a rise of social movement that really, I mean, question really the the whole status quo, and 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 and, and it de develops in in very very various forms. Mm 
Right. Yeah, I think um, there's one question that I really like to pose to you. I think it's really important by Alexa Fiat, who says, you know, we speak quite a bit about the intersections between Islam and feminism, but um, in terms of um, intersections of uh, feminism, of women, of other ethnic groups, eth ethnic and religious groups, um, I mean, we haven't talked about Kurdish women, but in mm. terms of also other religious groups, um, can you say a little bit about that? I mean, we're running out of time, so I'd like to maybe get in one more question, so if you can mm -hmm. try to be brief. Okay, I'll be very, uh, I'll try to be very brief. So there is a chapter in the book dedicated to Kurdish feminist activism. Uh, and, and what I'm talking about is the activism happening in Iraqi Kurdistan or in, so in, in the provinces that are uh, autonomous and independent, quite independent from, from Iraq since the 90s. So this is a, a, a an activism that, of course, is connected to, 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 to central Iraq, but has also developed on its own uh, since the 90s. Um, but now when it comes to other forms of religious activism, um, I mean, going back to the point about post-2003 identity politics, um, the, the Christian uh, woman activists, the, the, the Yazidi woman activists, for example, that I interviewed, they all kind of, kind of gravitate around civil society uh, uh, like al Harak al Medani, the, the the civil society type of activism. Uh, um, so 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 they would actually develop that activism in a, in, a, in a more let's say Medani or, or slash secular way, right? Uh, as as they identify, as they 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 really develop ideas around a, a strong state supposed to protect all of of, of Iraqi citizens, basically. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to. Um pose two more questions and if you can answer them together. One by Hint Ahmed Zaki who um, says, uh, who asked about um, initi initiatives around gender-based violence. We have seen in other uh, parts of the region that there has been a proliferation of groups who are mobilizing against gender-based violence, especially uh, since 2011, um, Egypt and Tunisia. Are there similar groups in Iraq? And uh, if so, what do they work on? Uh, and then the final uh, question is, uh, are you planning to write a new book about the Tahrir demonstrations, the more recent demonstrations? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, so about gender-based violence, yes, I mean, there are different strategies and, and, and I have dedicated, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm actually drafting an article on, on this, uh, talking about um, the different strategies of feminists, the, the ones that are really uh, acting as at a more grassroots level, kind of establishing their own institution, their own um, kind of apparatus, right? To so opening their own shelters, managing it themselves outside of the state, while actually being uh, being um, attacked by the state. And it's it's the case of the organization of women's freedom in Iraq that has been uh, attacked by the state and that is being you know currently threatened actually by the Iraqi state and political establishment. But you also have. Uh, um, a, a wide network uh, which is more gra gravitating around uh, the Iraqi women's network uh, that is working, uh, I, I would say at another level, like really trying to pressure uh, political parties to lobby, right? Going to talk to religious institutions, uh, uh, talking to political parties and trying to lobby to implement uh, uh, a law that would sanction. So at, at first it was, it was supposed to be domestic violence and now the, the the, the, the framing is, is going more towards family violence, right? And so the, the argument that is being used by a lot of activists is to say, well, we should, it's, it's also a strategy against the, the conservative backlash that is accusing them of wanting to divide the family. So what uh, activists are actually uh, now saying is, well, we want a law that protects the family from violence because the whole family is victim of violence. So we want a law that would. So, so I mean, there are a lot of negotiate, negotiations going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to be able to just, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, get the parliament to vote a, a basic law that would sanction domestic or family violence. Uh, uh, and then with the th 30 seconds so remaining. Before you, before you uh, answer that question, can I just uh, quickly intervene here and say, then of course, if you look at Iraqi Kurdistan, the issue of gender-based violence has been a really, really a major source of mobilization 
um, and that really uh, requires a whole other session. But um, I mean, I think both Zaha and myself are very much aware uh, that you know Kurdish women activists have been also mobilizing around uh, gender-based violence, you know, for for quite a while now. So yes. yeah, wrapped it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, you, and 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 yes, and the context is is quite different yeah. as well. It's very very different. So because also you just have a Kurdish state that is of course, I mean, in 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 relation to the central government, but that is pretty functioning. So just just this is a is a major difference um, uh, along uh, um, many many other uh, differences. And and yes, regarding the, the the uprising, this is my my next new book project is actually to dedicate it to the uprising and and try to provide some kind of, of um, transnational feminist uh, understanding of, of the current uprising. Yeah, um, there are more questions, but unfortunately we'll have to wrap up. I'm really sorry about the technical glitch. Uh, and, oh, uh, this has been so for, stressful. For bearing <laughs> with us. Yeah, I'm sorry, Zaha. It was, um, you know, that, that happens. That's uh, the period we live in, uh, Zoom yeah. and uh, internet connections. Uh, I like you like to thank you all for attending and bearing with us despite some of these hiccups. Um, thanks so much, Zaha. Uh, the you, video of this uh, event, a uh, recording of this event, will be available on our Center for Middle East Studies website once it's edited. So give us just a few days. So we'll share it and then you know you can circulate. Um, and um, hope to see you in the future at other events, hopefully without technical glitches. Hopefully for yes. real, in real life. <laughs> yes, in real life, that is true, um, soon again. Zaha, mm. thank you. Thank Take you, care. thank you so much, Nadia. Thank you, Barbara, thank you, Alexander, yes. and, 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 and all, all of you who, who helped organize and set up this, uh, this event. Thank you so much. Indeed.